today's title is why they need testing it's a part of uh, uh, three series and uh, i'll be hosting the webinar we are thrilled to have participants joining from all across locations bringing together diverse range of experience and perspective thank you all for taking time to be here so before we dive into the exciting agenda i would like to emphasize the critical importance of today's topic fire detector are our first line of defense in ensuring safety against hazards understanding their operations and the necessity of regular function testing is not a technical matter it's a crucial part of safeguarding our buildings workplaces and public areas uh, this is a cpd what is cpd continuing professional development program for maintenance engineers and the fire officers and facility managers we will issue cpd certificate endorsed by fia which is fire industry association it's a trade association from uk so those who are attending all the three different series will get a certificate endorsed by fia remember this is this webinar is an interactive we encourage you to ask questions and share your insight you can use chat box or i would recommend you to put your questions in q and a box when you look below there is a menu you know share q and a chat so i would urge everyone to put your question in q and a box to the speaker and moderator so i would like to thank once again we hope this session will be enlightening and if you have any questions if you are unable to hear out you can put it on chat box my colleague lakshmi and navya will be able to support you in resolving your issue as i was saying in introducing we have a very large very experienced speaker today paul gettens so he joined us from uh, uk i think uh, it's time around 10 o'clock or going to be 10 o'clock in uk so he has over 10 years of fire industry experience so he currently supports worldwide customer base with product supports and training works closely with detector manufacturers and industry trade associations he is a regular speaker at industry events paul also can be found on youtube channel as a presenter of a popular toolbox called toolbox talks a welcome to paul and we are going to enlighten by his knowledge and his experience he is going to talk about it and we have our uh, uh, indian uh, business development manager for detector tester parul verma who can be seen in the screen a very encouraged very thrilled to speak about our experience so she joined detector tester a year back at with over 20 years of experience in indian fire and security industry she has worked in all kind of businesses she has dived uh, at dev business development operations sales and marketing and project management so i know parul since many years over 15 years she most hard working lady in the fire industry and as she is going around to increase the awareness of fire detector testing so with this i would like to welcome uh, parul and uh, where is the unshared screen yeah stop sharing i would like to welcome a uh, paul and uh, parul uh, to the session parul uh, before yes, uh, before um, uh, paul comes in you know the today's topic why it's so important to the building owners facility managers fire officers because you know the fire department supposed to test the fire system or fire protection system including fire detector mm -hmm. do you think whether fire department has this tool to check whether smoke detector are functioning is it not necessary that even the fire department must have this tool to see whether the fire detectors are functioning and also the facility managers though we have a amc annual maintenance contract with the fire contracting company 
Don't they think that every occupant, every owner must have a tool that can be tested at any given time? Okay. Thirdly, how do you certify the fire engineers to maintain the smoke? Do you have any uh, you know, program to give a certification to the contractor? Yes, this contractor has the tools, methods and train to maintain a fire alarm system. And the challenges that you face in testing the smoke detector today. So over to you Parul, just before Parul comes, let's begin the session with your opening remarks. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you all for taking time out from your busy schedules to join us today for a series of webinar, uh, which are going to be uh, three numbers, and we begin today. And like uh, Dominic said that uh, Paul, who is a technical sales and support specialist, he also is an expert trainer on, uh, you know, compliant testing of fire detectors. And his knowledge and experience covers not only, you know, from within detector testers, like from what we are doing as det at detector testers as, you know, global leaders in testing technology, but also from the customers across the globe. You know, he's got a good, you know, uh, complete details of how, you know, detector testing is so important and he's going to speak about it. And uh, before that, before Paul speaks i would just like to take five minutes of your time and uh you know i've been with detector testers for an year and i've gone gone all around india and i it's uh really sad to say that we are still not the awareness levels are really low even now as far as testing is concerned you know testing of fire alarm detectors is concerned and uh the main, you know, what are the current challenges we are facing in maintaining a fire alarm system? What are the current methods we are, you know, using in maintaining a fire alarm system? All that has come to light to me. And like today, I would like to just share that, you know, in Taiwan cities, as Dominic said, now fire alarm system, maintaining the fire alarm system. One is we have invested in installing a fire alarm system, but maintaining is maintaining it is equally very very important you know to keep our property and life safe and uh when we are investing on you know a fire alarm system and we need to protect that also the investment we are protecting our investment let the building owners and everybody understand lives property and the investment they have made on a fire alarm system that is equally important in taiwan cities you know the Fire alarm systems earlier were installed for an NOC or because it is now like, you know, to as per the law, it is we have to install a fire alarm system. That's why. But now it's not the case anymore. You know, people have become aware that it's so important to safeguard our properties and lives. And for that, uh, but, you know, the thing is, everybody should ask themselves the question is that are we using the proper method? to maintain these, you know, uh, installations, the fire alarm detectors. People I still see are using magnets, lasers, you know, and incense sticks, burning paper. So that's not the right method. Yes, I can say 10 to 20 percent are using our solo brand, which is 25 years uh, since it's been in this industry. So they are using quite a few builders and uh, you know the facility management people are using solo which is an aerosol based uh, functional testing system but we have moved further from the aerosols we are also having electronic testing equipment so now i am going around the country making people aware of this and i would really request everybody to like listen to what paul has to say how important it is to maintain your fire alarm systems. Tier 2 cities still, you know, installing fire alarm systems is also not yet, uh, you know, that important to people. So I would request everybody who is here today that please see to it that one is we all have fire alarm systems in place and next is we maintain them in such a way that in case of a fire, we immediately know that there's a fire, our detectors are working, and we're able to take action and save lives and property. So I think with this, uh, let uh, us welcome Paul today. Dominic, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Parul. Uh, 
we will continue to discuss uh, various points because we have a wonderful yes. audience today i think uh, everybody is quite interested to know you know uh, where how the smoke detector can be tested so paul over to you you can take it from here hi and welcome thank you very much for all and dominic for that um, really nice introduction um it's um it's a cold chilly morning here in the uk and um i'm really looking forward to this particular session um some really exciting uh, subjects that we're actually going to be covering so let's uh, let's make a start hopefully you can see the screen all well so a little bit about detector testers i mean parole has told you quite a bit about us but uh we're a growing company and, um, you know, we are continuing to dominate within a global market. And we have so much experience based upon our solo products that have been available for a long time now. And as Perul was explaining, you know, electronic products now are coming to the forefront, you know, as new technologies coming through. And we're going to see much in the way of development in that, that front. Um, in regards to our relationships with various different companies, we've got very good, close relationships with the detector manufacturers. And one of the things I'll be talking about in the training is all to do with best practice recommendations and what the manufacturers actually say in regards to best practice, uh, as well as ourselves. So that's a little bit about ourselves. So let's have a look at the overview for the session. Um, we've got protection of property and life safety. Just got a couple of slides on that. As I mentioned, I want to cover best practices. These are absolutely key because this is much of the basis of what many standards and codes are actually based upon. We'll then touch very briefly about standards and codes. And one of the areas that on a on forthcoming series, we're going to be diving into a lot more detail. But at this stage, on this particular session, we're just going to be giving a quick overview of that. Talking about competency and responsibility. That's a, a key area to make sure we understand what is meant by those particular terms. We look at false alarms and detector technology, again, at a very basic level. And we will be diving deeper into this on the forthcoming uh, sessions that we have um, uh, planned. And then finally, very basics of detector testing as well. So let's crack on. So protection of life and assets. It's not only about protecting your invest your investments that's absolutely key you know you really got to be aware of what the point of a fire detection system is all about and fire protection systems um perform at least two of the following three objectives they either protect the property protect the occupants and also they can ensure commercial business is actually continued and this is absolutely key and it's going to be at least two of those particular aspects um one of the things that puts things into perspective a little bit, I've, I've pulled out some figures from various different insurance companies and uh, organisations in the UK and America. In the UK, the NFU, um, the National Farmers Union uh, Mutual Insurance Company, it's a very big insurance company over here. They've got stats based on fires in commercial buildings. And basically, um, they've actually said that 80 percent of UK businesses fail within 18 months, months of having a fire. So they fail to reopen after they have a fire in the usa it's very similar sort of uh, figures here this one's from fema the federal emergency management agency and they uh, have actually found that 40 percent do not open after a fire and then a further 25 percent fail the businesses fail within the first year after a fire so these are the stats that we're trying to actually avoid we i don't i can't find any stats at the moment available in india it may be higher we don't actually know one of the things that's a, a common miscon, uh, misconception here is in regards to building and contents insurance. Uh, and many people think that buildings insurance uh, and contents insurance will allow business to recover. You know, all I need is a fire detection system. I don't need to actually to maintain it. But, you know, fire um, insurance doesn't necessarily give you uh, the reward that you would need to recover after a, a fire. So that's just the basics of it. Let's just move on. So it's all about understanding what the risks and hazards are. What is your awareness? And one of the things that's really key here, and I've uh, been looking into this into many different regions around the world, and really uh, awareness of risk ex it, uh, increases with the experience, which leads to better standards and regulated law. Um, you know, we all think that uh, we're doing the best that we can, but it really quickly comes to light that uh, perhaps there's still room for error. 
And one of the stories I'm going to relate to here is uh, one of the, 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 the big disaster in recent time here in the UK, which is the Grenfell Tower disaster, uh, which then led to a subsequent uh, investigation and highlighted numerous areas of improvement. And just to put this in perspective, some of you in India probably haven't heard about the Grenfell Tower disaster, but it was a 24 storey tower in North Kensington in West London, and it burned for 60 hours and 72 people died and a further two more died later in hospital. There were 70 injured and uh, thank God there was at least 223 escapes. And it's the worst fire that we have had in the UK since World War II. So that really did shake up the industry. And there's been a lot of uh, ramifications that have come out of the back of that to try to raise uh, the awareness and try to improve uh, standards as a whole and that's within the UK. So back to risks and hazards, um, protection of property and life uh, uh, against fire, it's all about understanding what the risks and hazards actually are. What are the risks and hazards to the building, uh, the occupants and the contents? This usually is looked upon and understood as a, as a basis. Um, if there is a fire protection system installed, does it work? Um, what are the risks and hazards to ongoing performance of the fire detection systems? You know, buildings do change and that changes, you know, they change in their, uh, what they store within them, the processes that go on within the buildings. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, the, uh, this basically means that we need to continually review the risks and the hazards. So uh, one way to do this is to have correct and compliant test and maintenance. It's absolutely essential. So let's just talk about fire risk assessment in a little bit more detail. Um, in India, you have the fire safety audits and it's an effective tool for assessing risks and hazards and it's carried out by a competent person. We'll be talking more about what a competent person actually is on a later slide. And the fire risk assessment or fire safety audit, it identifies the risks and hazards and uh, defines the level of fire protection and also the maintenance is actually required because it's all about identifying those risks and hazards. The fire safety audits are not a mandatory requirement all over India. As far as I understand, it's only in certain states and regions uh, that that is the case. In the UK, we have a, a risk assessment, which is all intents and purposes the same thing. And this is a mandatory requirement all over the actual UK. Every building owner has to have a yearly uh, risk assessment to check to make sure that the risks and the hazards are known. So why test? This is the big question. This is the, the, the reason you've come along. What is the point of a fire detection? If you don't know, it will work when it's actually called upon to do so. You need to be able to prove those detectors have been installed correctly. Um, there could well be environmental influences that impact the performance. You know, for example, water damage, dust and dirt, changes of building layout, et cetera, can actually have an impact uh, on the performance of the fire detection system. Detectors not maintained or inspected in line with manufacturer's guidelines may well fail. And it's not necessarily just about testing them to make sure that the, the device is working. It also tests the installation. And this is where we're going to be talking on talking about a functional test. And certainly in my experience, I've seen on numerous occasions detectors that have actually been installed and the electronic self-testing indicates they're working correctly. But a functional test carried out by a competent person indicates that the device isn't working and it's all to do with incorrect uh, installation. So it's not only about the device's functionality, it's about checking that they have actually been installed correctly. And this is all uh, performed uh, through by a competent person. There's that word again, which we'll come back and we'll actually unwrap that in more detail. And they're carrying out a functional test because that's the way you get the highest level of confidence uh, through carrying out a functional test by a competent person. And if we look to most national and international standards, they recommend a functional test as the best way to give the highest level of confidence. So what does competent mean? And it's it comes down to having a proven, relevant and current training. That is absolutely key. Um, it's it, we're going to go into this and to talk about this in more detail, but a competent person should have proven relevant current training on whatever task they're carrying out. 
We should be aware that there are electronic self-tests uh, being performed. And also, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in many instances, there's no tests. And none of those give you the same level of confidence as a functional test. You know, they don't test the device and the installation. So what is a functional test? Um, basically, it's firelight phenomena. That is smoke, heat, carbon monoxide, or any combination can travel unhindered from the protected room. This is the area where the device is, the detector is installed into the detector chamber to cause an activation. And we have numerous examples of those words or variations on those words in standards all around the world. And on the left hand side there, I've got what British standards actually says, clause 45.4. And again, we'll be going into the clauses within the various different standards in much more detail in the subsequent uh, courses that we're following up with. So British standards says test should ensure elements of combustion can travel unhindered from the protected room into the chamber and cause an activation. So that is what endorses the use of our test equipment, be it solo or tested by, because those products all carry out a functional test. So I mentioned best practice earlier, and it's important to have an understanding what best practice actually is. The tasks to test and maintain a fire detection system are highlighted by national and international fire standards. We know that. These are a collection of best practice recommendations. National and international fire standards equal the minimum requirements. So they are the absolute minimum. So, for example, in British standards, there's a requirement to test every detector at least once a year and to visit the site at least twice. That is a minimum requirement. Compliance with standards can be enforced by law in some regions. And we do see various takes on this. We get situations where the laws do actually exist and some of these laws are self-regulatory and not actually policed. We'll talk more about that later. Fire standards don't stand still. And as we said earlier, as people's perception of risk changes, it's all through their experience. And there are a number of areas where um, they can improve in it. And it's down to a greater awareness of the risks and hazards. As you become more aware of risks and hazards, become more risk averse. Technology uh, comes along to solve problems. I mean, we're very instrumental in that. Detector testers are continually working and investing lots of money in new technology to assist and to help make sure our fire detection systems uh, work as best as they possibly can. Um, changes to best practices. These come about quite regularly. Um, you know, there's a whole array of different areas where new best practices that come into place. Many of them do come from manufacturers, which ultimately can find their way into, into regional and national standards. Costs is another area. You know, um, costs can have an impact on what's in standards. And one particular example we're going to be talking more about is the cost that are associated with uh, false alarms. Fire detection systems that are not maintained correctly can generate false alarms, and those false alarms have a, uh, a cost associated with them. Again, we'll talk about that later. Another inference to standards here is our disasters. Unfortunately, like the Grenfell Inquiry and the uh, subsequent Hackett Report, that's the one that I'm going to make reference to here, but there's numerous others, unfortunately, and they do have a devastating effect on the standards and they make sure that standards are continually to move. Another area which we should talk about is education and the importance of educating people is absolutely key. And certainly from our training courses that we've been running from detector testers, we've been seeing a big increase in numbers of people from different walks of life coming on to their training courses to want to understand about test and maintenance of fire detectors. Historically, our courses were aimed at the maintenance engineer, but certainly now we're seeing people that perform risk assessors, building owners, designers, you know, uh, etc., coming along in our training course. We've even had people from the fire brigade coming on our, our, our training course uh, as well. And our the appeal that our courses has seems to get wider as more and more people get interested in um, you know, what are the risks and hazards and what's involved with having a correctly maintained fire detection systems. So manufacturers' best practice recommendations all, always fall in line with standards and they give additional information that relates to the best use of their equipment as well. So they go over and above what's actually in the standards. 
So you won't be surprised to hear that de uh, Detective Tester's best practice is performing a functional test will give you the highest practical confidence that the system will be fit for purpose. OK, so we've spoken about best practices. That's just talk a little bit about standards and codes. And as I say, this is a real basic introduction here. And we will be diving into a lot more depth in this in the following uh, courses. So when it comes to standards, um, there are two types of standards that we need to know about. One is to do with product standards, the standards at which the products are made to. So be that a fire panel or a fire detector or a sounder, for example, they are made to a particular product standard. The other area which we spend probably more time diving into is the standards that refer to service and maintenance. The service and maintenance standards maintain the performance of the installed uh, products. So the whole point of a standard is to prove a reliable basis for people to share the same expectations about a product or a service. So it's important to understand those are the two bases. Now we're gonna dive into these in a little bit more detail. So when it comes to product standards, there are a number of different product standards around the world, but the two in particular that we are interested in, the two main ones that have an impact on um, India and also Europe and the UK are the European EN standards. And in America, you've got the UL standards. So those are the two uh, main leading product standards that exist. Now, most regions are supplied with products from one of these particular standards, either EN or UL. And then they follow the related standards for test and maintenance to match those product standards. So if it's European standards, they will follow the European related type standards. If it's American standards, UL product standards, they will be following those particular standards. Some regions are supplied with products from both regions. And India is absolutely key here. They use fire detection products from both Europe to EN standards and America and UL standards. This means we have several service and maintenance standards that we need to consider. I should also add there are other building regulations, which again, I'll dive into at a later course, but uh, we're just talking about uh, service and maintenance standards at this level. So let's have a look at service and uh, maintenance standards that we should be aware of. As uh, India uses products from both America and Europe, uh, we need to cover the related standards. Now, uh, in the UK, we have British standards, and because they've been around for a number of years and they're continually actually updated, many worldwide standards have come from British standards. Some of them have, uh, are based on it and then been updated and uh, been adapted accordingly. But when it comes to British standards, there's two particular areas that we need to be aware of, and they're both related to 5839. 5839 Part 1, last updated in 2017, is due an update at any time now, covers fire detection systems, the design, installation, commissioning and maintenance of them for commercial uh, buildings. Part 6 is the same thing, but that relates to domestic premises. And that was last updated in 2019. If we move on to Europe, they have uh, uh, CEN 5414, last updated in 2018. Now that was a direct derivative from 5839 part one. And that is starting to gain traction uh, out there. Um, new countries as they're raising their standards, European countries, many of them are looking at the 5414 uh, as the standard to actually to follow. Now, we mentioned the American standards. Well, it's NFPA 72, and that was last updated in 2022. And that covers the design, installation, inspection, test and maintenance of fire alarm systems, both residential and commercial. India also has its own standards, uh, IS 2189, last updated in 2018. Uh, and in a very similar manner, covers everything to do with the service, installation, and maintenance of automatic fire detection systems. Now we've got a number of different standards here. They have their own clauses in, and again, we'll be looking at the differences between those clauses and understanding some of the subtle little differences between them uh, as we go through the subsequent courses. But I just wanted to bring that uh, to your uh, attention. Those are the uh, service standards that we're going to be talking about. Okay, we mentioned the word competency several times, and we should also understand a little bit about responsibility. 
And what I'm going to do here is really just talk about what's uh, happened within the UK. We, in the UK, we have the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order. That is the law, and the law makes reference to British standards. Um, it's quite interesting to note that um, one particular um, fashion, if you like, within laws uh, around the world is to introduce self-regulatory laws. These are laws which are not actually policed. Governments find it really expensive to police um, you know, laws, so they much prefer to pass on the responsibility down the line to those that are actually uh, um, responsible. Um, it's enforced. What you'll get in some countries is that the laws are actually enforced and other countries, sometimes they're not actually enforced. So there's all these subtle differences between them. But let's have a look at what the UK law says. So the UK law uh, makes it very clear there is somebody that is actually responsible and that's the owner occupies designated responsible person under the UK law. They must ensure the standards are complied with um, and they risk prosecution if they fail to do so. And what we've seen, and again, this a lot of this it comes about after um, disasters like the Grenfell disaster. I mean, the, the, what happened after the Grenfell disaster was that the uh, UK government was saying, you know, we all must do better. We must uh, we make sure our systems are better maintained. We must sure they're documented actually better. And um, one of the areas where definitely the bar has actually been raised is in the courts, in the law courts. The law courts have actually... Um, up to the levels of prosecutions and investigations. And we're now seeing unlimited fines and up to 20 months imprisonment um, for anybody that doesn't comply with the fire safety laws that we actually have over here. Now, um, the responsible person must be able to prove, provide ed evidence that their fire system is fit for purpose, being designed, installed, commissioned, maintained, and risk assessed in accordance with British standards. This is achieved by a mandatory fire safety risk assessment, as we said earlier, work being carried out by somebody who's actually competent, they can prove they know what they're talking about, and having documented evidence through a fire safety logbook. This is historically how it's actually been achieved. So we need to dive in and have a better understanding what is meant by the word competent. And probably the best way is just to give you a little story here. Um, I'm a homeowner. I own my own home here in the UK. I'm a bit of a uh, an avid DIYer. I like doing my own maintenance on my house. I fit kitchen cabinets. I've even been known to do electrical work and plumbing. Am I capable? Well, I think I'm actually capable of doing it. Um, am I competent? No, I'm not competent. I have no way of proving that I know what to, what I know. But then again, who am I responsible to? I'm responsible to myself. I'm not providing a service to anybody else. And that is the key thing. Is products manufactured and sold by detector testers, our best practice, are designed to be used by a competent, a trained engineer. And when you look in the eyes of the law, the English law, anybody that's contracted to work on a fire detection system must be competent. So what is meant by competent? And again, if we look to 5839, there's a clause here, clause 3.12, and it says person with the relevant current training and experience and has access to the requisite tools, equipment and information capable of carrying out the divine task. Now, let's break that down and just go in through that in a little bit of detail. Now, first of all, relevant current training. Now, that was a change. Those words were changed in 2013. And prior to 2013, it used to say necessary training. So people were going on the necessary training, but they weren't necessarily keeping them relevant to the task and they weren't certainly weren't keeping them current. The inclusion of the words relevant and current was a recognition to the, the fact that we never stop learning. And the best way to demonstrate you never stop learning is through some sort of documented evidence. And this is where CPD comes in, continuous professional development, which we'll talk about in a minute. Experience. Well, experience only comes with time, unfortunately. Um, I mean, here in the UK, we've got a real skill, as I'm sure we have in many areas. Uh, and uh, well, there's um, a, a big expansion of the apprenticeship schemes that are going on. So there are lots of young people now going through the training and they're shadowing their engineer, uh, experienced engineers to gain that experience. So experience just comes in time and working on the system. 
access to the requisite tools. Well, this is obviously where Detector Testers comes in. We're the leading manufacturer of test tools, test and maintenance tools for fire detection systems. And you need to make sure you have the, 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 the uh, required tools to do the job. Uh, equipment. There are additional things that you might need. You might need, for example, uh, test equipment to test the batteries in the panel, or maybe you need test sets to test, uh, you know, the individual fire detectors, which is separate to a functional test. Information. Information is quite a big area. And um, you've got information on the standards, you've got information on the law, you've got the manufacturer's best practice. Um, all this information um, the whoever the competent person is, whatever task they're carrying out, they need to make sure they have that information to hand. Now, in this digital age, when most people are carrying around phones with little knowledge bases on there. They can very quickly and easily store copies of the standards, copies of the best practices and the various different instruction manuals from the uh, from the manufacturers. Um, so, you know, that's actually key that they have that and capable of carrying out the defined task. Now, we mentioned this earlier, what the defined tasks are in regards to uh, a fire detection system. You've got the design of a fire detection system. You've got the instant fire uh, detection system, commissioning, maintenance, and then the risk assessment. So your skills must be relevant and current in the area that you're carrying out, whatever the task is you're actually carrying out. Again, if we draw reference back to the Hackett report, don't forget it was the Hackett report that came out of that, that dreadful uh, Grenfell disaster. Uh, Dame Judith Hackett mentioned the word competency 152 times in her report. So in the UK, it's quite well known that we have a big problem in actually proving that those that are actually out there doing the job know what they're doing. And this is an area of growth at the moment within the UK where they're trying to come up with schemes and ideas to help to prove and to demonstrate that the engineers that are doing the job you know, do know what they're talking about. So let's just talk about demonstrating competency. And again, I'll make reference here to the UK. Uh, and this is um, very much in the same line in other organisations, uh, other regions as well. So you've got um, uh, training that is required. And there's different areas of training, standards and the law. Um, there are a number of organisations around uh, the world that offer multi-day courses that go into quite a bit of detail to do with the standards and law. And these are accredited courses. And one of, um, one of the providers of this is the FIA, as mentioned by Dominic earlier. FIA is the leading trade manufacturer here in the UK. And increasingly, they're moving out of the UK and into other countries. And they provide training, um, you know, uh, multi-day training courses to those that do the design work, those that do the installation, those that do um, the commissioning or, or the actual maintenance or the risk assessment. They offer all those courses, as do other organisations like the FPA. And we've got the FES scheme now starting up here. And what's coming about is really here is there is a qualification level now look, going, starting to gain traction. And this is level three qualification. And this seem to be a minimum. It's not quite there yet where everybody's actually got it, but it's the uh, as a country, we're working towards that. Now, I should also talk about manufacturers training and you're on manufacturers training course now. Uh, we are a manufacturer and most reputable uh, manufacturers op offer CPD training. Uh, and the, there's a tra training on a whole array of different subjects. Out there. Most of these manufacturer CPD training are free of charge. And they're certainly worth attending because this is the best source to find what their best practices are, and what they recommend when it comes to their detectors, their panels, their sounders or their test equipment. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that to do the job in a competent way, we need to make sure that we can demonstrate we know what we're talking about in regards to health and safety. And it's one thing to do the job properly, but can you prove that you can work, can be carried out in a safe manner? And that is absolutely key as well. So one thing that directly relates to our equipment is we use our solo height access poles that gives height uh, access up to detectors mounted at nine metres. And we have a dedicated health and safety training course, all to do with safe use of our solo height access poles. Um, increasingly, another thing that's actually starting to happen in many regions around the world is card schemes or registers of competent engineers those collect all their qualifications together because increasingly what we're seeing is building owners are starting to say well you know if there's an engineer going to come on this site i want to know if they're actually qualified or not and certainly here in the uk and again many other areas you know the responsible person the building owner 
is actually responsible for checking out that the engineer does know what they're actually saying. So they're asking questions so for them to actually to prove their experience. And this is something that, again, is growing. Now, we've, many, we've, man, we've mentioned the word CPD, continuous professional development, and CPD demonstrates commitment to staff training and maintaining standards because the engineer starts to collect a training log together. And in that, they include all their certificates um, so that when they are questioned, they've got that that they can actually present. I should also mention that there's also um, ways for the company to demonstrate competency. And this is usually carried out through third party audits. Here in the UK, we have uh, UCAS as a, a body, a government body, which uh, accredits uh, a number of different bodies that go around BAFE and LPS 1014. And they carry out um, audits on the companies that provide the services. Now, if we step back from all of that, and if we just look from the point of view of the engineer, a competent engineer needs to document all the recommendations, standards, industry, manufacturer's best practices to the client. This is absolutely key. And again, a nice little story which highlights this. Back in 2010, um, there was a situation with a engineer called Christopher Morris in the UK here who was um, servicing fire detection systems. And he worked on a care home. And he went into the care home to do servicing on the fire panel. And the first thing he spotted was that the fire panel was out of the arc. It was really old. It had bulbs instead of LEDs. It had cartridge fuses actually in it. It was really ancient. His verbal advice to the client was, this is too old to work on. You know, you need to actually to replace this and put something in there that's actually more modern, which can actually be maintained. Unfortunately, um, the client went back to him and said, no, we're not spending any money. You do your absolute minimum just to keep it going. And he did exactly what he was told to do. Um, and the, 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 what then followed on was the fact there was a fire, there was fatalities. And that engineer ended up with a very big fine and he ended up in jail. And the biggest thing he did wrong is he didn't document his recommendations. If he'd actually put down his recommendations, he would have proof of what he actually offered them. He, if he then follows the advice of the actual client, um, then, you know, at least he's got the proof. He was telling him what the standards actually mean. He's telling him what the best practices actually meant. But in that instance, is he actually ended up in jail. So that's a worst case uh, scenario. So proving compliance, it's all about documented evidence and uh, either paper or more so now electronic format. You know, we live in this digital age and increasingly uh, we're seeing a move away from paper based systems to electronic systems. Uh, in the UK, we have the fire safety logbook, which is basically the proof that the fire detection system is fit for purpose and it's kept up to date and readily available for inspection and audit because we, it is possible for our fire and rescue service to come along and ask for it. But unfortunately, the paper based systems are frequently not kept up to date. They're lost and, um, you know, they're not necessarily really fit for purpose. The fire safety logbook can actually have information in there that um, can advise the engineer, the competent person. You know, it contains important information to a system with ongoing maintenance. It's in everybody's interest to make sure you keep that documentation up to date. And it has been in the UK and other countries as well. It can be used in the court of law, both to defend the owner and the engineer. Now, again, if we go back to the, um, the Grenfell disaster and the subsequent Hackett report. One of the things Dame Judith Hackett uh, uh, identified was that the you know the whole thing to do with documentation was a bit of a nightmare, and it was all because there's such heavy reliance on paper-based systems. And she made reference to the golden thread of in, uh, information, and what she was meaning was uh, it's all about keeping digital records because digital records you know are not going to get lost. They can automate the process to assist the building owner to prove um, their compliance. It can sell, help send automated emails. It can collect information that goes into the actual logbook. And one of the key bits here, which is really, really key, is it can give transparency to what work has actually been carried out on the fire detection system. Is the fire maintenance engineer actually doing a proper job because it can actually start to collect that information? And this is where it, it, things get a little bit more exciting, really, because once we've got transparency, um, the, the fire system is being maintained correctly. This is going to drive out some of the cowboy practices, the poor practices, the non-maintenance that's actually going on. And I think what it's going to do is it's going to uh, increase the value of a fire detection system 
and increase the value of the maintenance work that's actually carried out. Because in many uh, regions around the world, there isn't that facility, there isn't that transparency. And you know, some of the building owners say, well, what's the point of putting a fire detection system in if I don't necessarily know that the maintenance engineer is actually carrying out the work correctly? So I think you're going to see much in the way of development here, new technology coming through to assist, to help prove what work is actually being carried out. So false alarms and detector technology, you can't have any fire uh, courses these days without touching upon false alarms. And we need to understand a lot to do with false alarms because it's all about balancing the fire detection system. You've got to get that detection system right. It's got to be designed right for the building, the processes, you know, the risks and hazards within there. You've got to make sure that it's got the right level of sensitivity to make sure that people can actually escape in the case of a fire, but at the same time, not too sensitive uh, that it could actually cause false alarms. Unwanted fire alarm signals or false alarms. Most fire alarm and detection systems don't cause unwanted false alarms. It's the mismanagement that, that does. And when I say mismanagement, it's what the processes are actually going on in there, or sometimes it can actually be the fact that they're not maintained. In England, <clears throat> over a 20 year period, we've got data to indicate that fires and fatalities have been reducing, which is great, which is all in line with what I was actually saying about earlier, where um, basically as, as, as you become more experienced of what the risks and hazards are and you up your standards, it should mean that there is going to be less fires and less fatalities. And certainly we've got proof uh, to that effect. The downside of this in the England in, in England is that we have over that same period of time seen an increase in false alarms. And if you think about it, it's about assessing that uh, balance right. You've got to get that sensitivity balance right. You've got to get that right so that people are, are you know, able to escape. You could detect a fire before it actually gets a hold. But at the same time, you know, the technology isn't necessarily going to alarm, you know, because somebody has been smoking a cigarette or there was steam from a shower or, or, or kettle or something like that. And, and this is where technology is coming along uh, to actually to assist that. Because if you do get false alarms, you get lost the production because everybody's standing in the car park. You know, they're not in the office or in the factory doing their work. And it all leads to a loss of confidence. And it can actually mean a cost to taxpayers as well, because, again, depending on uh, the region and uh, how um, the fire brigade is actually paid for. I mean, here in the UK, the fire brigade is paid for by the taxpayers. And there was some research back in 2018 by uh, a research establishment called BRE, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later on. And they identified that the bill to the taxpayer in England was a billion pound a year. That's false alarms. So it identified the fact that more needs to be done in this particular area. And certainly over the recent updates to the standards around the world, we've seen a big focus um, to try to drive down false alarms. Uh, but it mustn't be at the cost of increasing fires or fatalities. So we've got to get that balance right. How, do, how is this done? It's mainly through technology. And we've seen changes in detector technology over the last few years um, that has brought its own challenges. It's balancing the sensitivity, but it means that some of the systems are a little bit more complex and they need to be a bit better trained engineers to actually to work on it. We've also seen big changes in best practices and again, standards as well and also training and proving that actual competency. And if we were to look at what's happened in England and the latest information that I can get my hands on, it still shows that false alarms are still increasing. The rates of increase is slowed down. It was 1% over the last year and 7% over the last five, uh, five years. It's still increasing, so more still needs to be done. I'm sure the next update to British standards will have many changes in there to try to drive down false alarms. So let's talk about detector sensitivity here, because this is what it's all about. It's understanding how uh, the sensors work in detectors and getting that right balance. Higher sensitivity detectors have uh, quick reaction times, uh, which it can be really good. But the downside of that can mean that they could potentially cause false alarms. Low sensitivity detectors, they have slower reaction times and they're very resistant to false alarms. Uh, and again, it's understanding the differences between these. And what we're now starting to see is smarter detection systems being installed. And in particular, it's multi sensors. These are detectors that have multiple sensors. And the idea here is to address that balance to get that quick reaction when there is a fire. Yet 
proved to be, um, you know, to push back against uh, false alarms. So when we're talking about point type detectors, these are the detectors that most are the most commonly installed. They do have different sensitivities or different times to alarm. The smoke sensor historically for many years has been the, the main type of sensor that is used within buildings. And it's great at actually identifying fires very, very quickly. Um, but it, as I said, you know, in some instances, some of the more basic, the cheaper ones can cause false alarms. You then got heat detectors and alarms, you know, where you've got firelight phenomena, you know, you might have, for example, a kitchen, which could, you know, there could be phenomena in there that could actually falsely alarm uh, a smoke detector. If you put a heat detector in there, it's going to make sure it's not going to false alarm. You've got a big growth in carbon monoxide at the moment. And again, this is something I'll save to a later session, which we'll go into more detail. But carbon monoxide um, is a byproduct of an incomplete combustion. Um, they, you can find the CO sensors in fire alarms, but you also see CO sensors in life safety alarms. And I will be talking more about the difference there because there's potentially a big growth in that area, particularly to do with life safety. And, and there's quite a few questions around actually testing that. Multi sensors and multi criteria detectors. It's multi sensors which are really starting to make their way into the market now because these are looked upon as being the most effective way of actually driving down. Um, false alarms. They ha can have uh, two or three or sometimes four different sensors actually installed in them. They can be configured in many instances to give different uh, levels of sensitivity according to the risk or the site they're actually installed in. I should briefly just explain the difference between multi-criteria and multi-sensor detectors. Multi-criteria also have uh, multiple sensors in them, but they don't have necessarily have different times to alarm to how they're configured. They're usually a lower cost device. And these are devices um, that are actually uh, installed um, where you know money and the cost of protection is absolutely key. Most standards don't necessarily, dif dif uh, uh, service and maintenance standards don't differentiate between multi-sensor or multi-criteria uh, devices, but there is a big difference in the actual performance and, and how they actually work. Um, Standards talk about testing all enabled sensors. That is what's been around for a few years now. So if you've got a multi-sensor that's got a smoke and a heat sensor, for example, the standard would imply that you should test all those enabled sensors actually in there. And it doesn't really say, you know, only on the multi-sensor or multi-criteria. It just says multi, you know, you know, enabled sensors. So that can mean both multi-sensors and multi-criteria detectors. Okay, let's just talk a bit more about smoke detectors because uh, this is something we're going to unwrap in further detail on subsequent uh, uh, sessions that we're going to have. The most common sensor in a fire detector is smoke. And what we've seen is the technology that's used within these sensors in these detectors has changed. Historically, they used to use ionization, a radioactive ionization uh, sensor in there, which is slowly being phased out. The ionization sensors are certainly have key particular advantages, but they had one big disadvantage in the fact that they have a piece of radioactive isotope. And for, as we become more and more risk averse, there's been a drive to move away from ionization. And the replacement technology that came along was called uh, optical beam. And it's what is more most common these days. Now, we've been fitting optical detectors for a number of years, and it's taken a little bit of time to actually to start to understand you know, what's going on with some of these optical detectors. And there was some research carried out by BRE, Building Research Establishment here in the UK. This is the largest fire research facility in Europe, and it supports the development of both product standards, EN and British standards uh, as well. And a couple of things they came to light. They found that during the life of a detector, there will be airborne dirt and dust in the area. And it, the level of how much dirt and dust in the area is going to depend on the location. You know, you could have processes going on, which means you have a lot of airborne dirt and, uh, and dust. And if you get dark colored dust going into an optical sensor, this can slow the activation down. Or if it's really bad, it means there is no activation at all. So this is absolutely key that a functional test is carried out because it will find if there is no activation, because if that detector isn't uh, going to work in the case of a fire, you know, you need to know about that. You've also got light colored dust, which can increase the sensitivity. And this can then lead to false alarms. The BRE report indicated that it is more likely to have an increase in sensitivity. So one of the factors here 
which could well be the case if, if these vices are not maintained correctly, is that you could start suffering from false alarms. And this could be a major contribution. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons that could contribute to false alarms. So let's now just step back from, uh, and again, just at a very high level, talk about the different fire detection systems there. And there's two particular systems that we should be aware of, addressable detector systems and conventional detectors. Now, addressable are the more expensive ones and that each detector has a physical address. And there's also some intelligence in these systems, which means that the panel is talking to the detector and it can identify things like, is there a buildup of dirt and dust in there? And they can change the compensation so they can uh, change the sensitivity level according to the dirt uh, that builds up inside a sensor, which is a real neat feature. They also have contamination warnings. So if the detector gets too dirty and it cannot be adjusted anymore, it will flag up a warning on the panel. This is brilliant. They also have the ability to have different modes of sensitivity as well. So again, you can have a detector and you can adjust the sensitivity according to the risk or the, the where it's actually the site's actually installed. So it's important to be aware of that. Now, addressable detectors, um, and again, this is a rough figure that I picked up across Europe, and, and it may vary from country to country, but typically there are about 50% of the devices that are actually installed. The other 50% of the devices installed are the cheaper conventional detectors, and cheaper conventional detectors do not have any of that level of functionality that I spoke above there. So if dirt and dust builds up in them, you know, they could start to malfunction very quickly and contribute to false alarms, and you wouldn't actually necessarily know things were starting to go wrong. So it's being aware of the fire detection system you've got installed. Have you got one of the addressable systems or have you got a conventional system? If you've got a conventional system, it's all the more important that fire detection system is actually maintained correctly. Testing trends. Okay, we need to address the balance of smoke detector sensitivity. We've got this, this situation where airborne dust and dirt is going into the, into the sensors and it could potentially uh, be contributing to false alarms, which then affects the protection of life and property. And then what's being done is there's more multi-sensors actually being installed, which is really good. And also there are detectors with longer integrating times and integrating times means time to alarm. And it's all about balancing that sensitivity because really what we've had, we've had great success in protecting um, people and property. If the system's actually maintained correctly with the, you know, with the newer uh, technologies that has actually come along, but we need to push back against false alarms. And what this means is that with longer integrating periods and multi-sensors, it has an impact on compliant testing. Um, best practice, as I said, which is actually now established in most uh, regional and international standards, is that all enabled sensors should be functionally tested. Um, and that's absolutely key. And one of the things that can happen because there isn't this understanding of what's actually happening with the technology, quite often engineers are not necessarily given enough time to do the testing. So some of them are cutting corners and not doing the best job. And it leads to non-compliant testing or in some cases, no testing. With these more complex devices, it comes to the point that the engineer needs to have a greater level of training. So it's all in more important that they're actually competent in what they're, uh, what they're doing. That's absolutely key. One of the things that we're going to be talking about is the different types of testing. And one of the types of testing that we have been leading the market in for many years is testing of smoke detectors using aerosol smoke canisters. It's been around, since, as Peru said, since the 1990s. It's been a very effective solution. But what we are now becoming aware of is there is misuse by untrained engineers out there, which could potentially shorten the detector lifespan and could potentially increase false alarms. That is a negative impact on the performance of the fire detection system. Another thing that's actually come to light as well, and this is all to do with longer integrating periods, is something called nuisance re-alarms. Now, nuisance re-alarms are um, basically add additional time to the maintenance of a fire detection system. When the engineer into, puts smoke into a fire detector, if, it, if there's too much smoke or there's various other uh, variables that come into play, it means that the detector will take longer to reset. And especially with these conventional detectors, these cheaper ones I spoke about, you have to go down to the fire panel, press the reset after every time you test a detector. And one of the situations that can actually occur is the engineer tests the detector, it goes off, 
It goes down to the panel, it press the resets, it comes back to the detector, only to find there is lingering smoke in and around the chamber. It's gone back into the chamber and cost it, caused it to go off again. So it then has to go all the way back to the panel again and press the reset button. And this can, in, in worst case scenario situations, if they don't understand what they're doing, this can you know lead to 20 minutes per detector. Or I had that one story of one engineer saying up to an hour. And it might be worth me just relating that story to you because I know you like to hear a few little stories. Uh, I, I talk a lot to our customers, and there was one particular customer who has been working for. He'd been working for Siemens, a big company, been using our electronic testers for many years, and he changed companies. He went to another company, and he got given this job to go and test the fire detection system in a crematorium. And he got told by his uh, manager, he said, you must be in and out of there by nine o'clock because the first hearse will be coming down the drive um, with, you know, the, with the first uh, uh, ceremony to actually to be to, to taken place. So he's in there testing his detectors, but he hasn't got his electronic tester. He's been changing his job. He's gone back to using aerosols. The last detector he tests is the one in the dome in the crematorium. It's early in the morning. It's cooler. And the de device probably has some sort of gauze around it to keep insects out. And what happens is he waited an hour for that device to actually to reset. And he said to me, he said, if I had an electronic tester, I would have tested it. I'd be gone and I'd be down the road. But because he's got an aerosol product and because of the, there were various different variables there that came into impact, he said, I ended up wasting an hour at that. Now, you'll have to come along to the next training session. where We're going to go into that in a lot more detail and explain what those variables actually are. So coming back to testing trends. Solutions, new testing technology means new detectors, which means there is a need for new types of testing, testing that can make things more efficient, more compliant, and also the need for competency through training. So the last section now, just bear with me, and um, we'll just finish off these last few slides, and we're just going to go back to the basics of testing to make sure we understand the difference between the different types of testing that goes on. So we mentioned briefly that there is electronic and button tests, which I'll give you a low level of confidence. Uh, it doesn't test the installation of the device. Most regions for commercial detectors, um, you know, do not endorse electronic or button tests in any way. Um, they do exist on some products and they are actually out there, but they don't give you that highest level of confidence. And in fact, there's actually um, evidence out there um, that this is the actual effect. Um, no test. Detectors that are not tested are frequently the detectors that will be relied on in a fire. And it may be they're just they're not being tested because nobody wants to test them, or it may be they're not tested because they're in a hard to access location. But again, you know, that is not a good situation at all. We then move on to functional testing. Uh, which we'll be talking much more about. And there's two types of functional testing here, really. Functional testing using our legacy aerosol canister-based products, uh, handles and, disp and the dispenser. And we'll be diving into them in more detail. But more now what we've got is functional tests using electronic testers, which is products like our Testify and our Solo 365. And one of the things you're going to learn is that the electronic uh, products overcome the issues that relate to incorrect use of the aerosols. When it comes to the aerosols, we still stand by aerosols and they're still, uh, uh, you know, used very effectively around the world. But the, 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 the ability to misuse them is becoming more common. And this is because of a number of factors that we need to actually to understand. And this is this really comes back to the importance of being trained to actually to use them correctly. So we'll look at functional tests using aerosol canisters and functional tests using electronics and comparing the difference so you understand the, 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 the two. The other area, and I made several references uh, on the slides previous to do with proof of compliance and what the packet report actually said. And there are a number of different devices coming to the market which will actually prove what fire detectors have actually been tested. And here at Detect Testers, we've been working on the latest generation of Testifier. This is known as the XTR2, which is a functional tester, but in addition, it collects an audit trail. It, tell, it will tell you which detectors activated and which ones didn't. So it gives you proof of compliance. It's that transparency I spoke about earlier, which is all going to help raise the value of your fire detection system and the, in, and the value of um, make sure that you know, the, the system is actually maintained uh, correctly. 
So we'll talk about that in a subsequent one. Uh, another type of um, testing which you should be aware of, and I'm going to put it in here and just mention it briefly, is sensitivity testing. This is particularly for smoke detectors. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that the American standard, the Canadian standard and the Australian standard is the, currently the only standards out there that recommend sensitivity testing of their smoke detectors. Most places around the world just rely heavily on the functional test, but there is the ability to do sensitivity testing. And I'll be talking about the differences between a sensitivity test. It's a far more labor intensive test. It's far more cumbersome. It takes longer to actually perform, but it's gonna give you an even higher level of uh, sensitivity. So finally, just finishing off now, just on the differences, and we're going, we're going to come back to this in uh, in future sessions. When it comes to fu uh, functional tests of smoke uh, detectors using aerosol canisters, you've got a handheld solution like our Smoke Saber, which is great. You know, if you've got easy to access detectors which are within arm's reach. Um, if you've got detectors that are beyond the reach of your arm, you don't want to endanger anybody by climbing ladders or getting onto any high access equipment. You can work all the way up to nine meters using our dispensers like the Solo 330. And the, we have dedicated aerosols which are specifically manufactured for use in the dispensers. And it's absolutely key um, for the engineer to be aware of the different types of uh, aerosols that we actually make because they have different nozzles and they're meant to be used in different ways. The other thing as well, which is absolutely key, is to make sure whatever test method you're using, make sure it is approved um, you know, for use on the detectors. And again, you won't be surprised to hear as the leading manufacturer, we work very closely with all the detector manufacturers and they endorse our aerosol canisters. The advantages are quick and easy to use, low cost, proven functional test solution for detectors, and they've been around a long time. And unfortunately, one of the things they've got is they've got a growing number of disadvantages that we will be diving into. It's very dated technology. This is for us, for testing detectors, it dates back to the 1990s. They're pressurized containers, so they're classified as dangerous goods. So you have to be very careful about storage and use of any aerosol canisters. Ambient temperature can have an impact on any, the canister performance. As the temperature rises, the pressure rises, and that means the dispersion rate is better, different. As the temperature drops, the canister gets colder, the pressure drops. And again, that has an impact on the performance. And again, we'll be learning more about that on our later sessions. The propellants that are used within the aerosols, some of them are flammable and some are non-flammable. You need to understand the difference between those. The legislation relating to use of aerosols, and it's not just our aerosols for producing smoke, it's all aerosols. It continues to tighten around the world. Part of it is environmental legislation that's come into impact, and some of that has already had an impact on our products that we manufacture, and we've had to change our products to make sure that they comply with the latest environmental legislation. You've also got the situation, because of what we've discussed earlier, to do with false alarms, you know, you've got longer times to alarm. And that really means that there is even more potential to misuse an aerosol canister by an untrained engineer. So it's, again, this is why it's so important. Time wasted with nuisance re-alarms, as we said, going back to the panel to re press the reset. This is becoming more and more of an issue um, uh, for the engineer. Some modern detectors now, some of the multi-sensors coming onto the market, they can't be tested with aerosols. So although aerosols can be seen as still an effective uh, solution in this day and age, they do have an increasing amount of drawbacks and they have issues, which basically mean that the people that use them have to be properly trained. And finally, to finish off, let's just uh, start looking at uh, electronic testers, which use cartridges. Um, these solutions have been around since the two, to 2007 in our testify. So they're not new solutions. They've been around for a long time. And the whole point of us de designing cartridge-based solutions is that we were aware of what's actually happening with, uh, with aerosol canisters. So we have a dedicated smoke dispenser, the Solo 330. We then have our multi-stimulus all-in-one testers like the Solo 1000 and 2000. And soon to be released is our new Testifier XTR2, which in addition has the proof of compliance. Many advantages they have over, that they're, because they're using cartridges, they're not pressurized containers, not classified as dangerous goods. They don't use flammable propellants. Um, they eliminate wasted time from nuisance rear alarms. They don't suffer from nuisance rear alarm. Much cleaner test. The smoke detectors last longer. There's no possibility for the engineers to misuse them. 
And when it comes to multi-sensors, you can test them much quicker if they uh, if you can test them in a combined test mode. And also the other thing with the, the all-in-one testers like Testify range in particular, you can test a wider range of detectors. So the engineer means they've always got the right tool to hand because quite common, you know, for somebody using an aerosol dispenser, they've got their dispenser with the aerosol canister, they're testing the smoke detectors, then they come across a heat uh, detector, they've got to go and get the other tester and sometimes they don't. But if you've got your testifier, it's just a matter of press of a button, you switch it from being a smoke tester to a heat tester. Now, at this stage, I just really wanted to give you an overview of the differences between those functional testers and we'll be going into more detail on the later sessions. So thank you very much for bearing with me. I hope you found that of interest and uh, use, and uh, I'd welcome any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, very enlightening and uh, various topic you touched upon uh, in the beginning. You know, you spoke about the responsibility of the occupants and the responsibility of the building owners, and you compared how UK is, uh, in, you know, what you call mandating the testing methods and what are the penalties that the government of UK has imposed. And uh, you spoke about the various type of detectors and uh, how these detectors are being tested. So ultimately the technology today, you know, how advanced you spoke about it. And I have uh, around 12 to 13, so I urge all the participants who are here so please post your questions so, so that next 15 20 minutes we can take up the questions and uh, possibly you know should, your question should be more relevant to what uh, Paul presented so that we, we can so there are few questions which Paul may not be able to answer because it's more Indian uh, uh, questions that uh, about the standards and methods anyway I will move to the questions first question uh, from the beginning, uh, Anug um, uh, Arunagiri, Arunagiri, his name, is there a specific code clause or authority requirement with state that the fire detector need to be tested using listed or approval toolkit in India? So as I think uh, Paul before you say, we do not have a, you know, codes are a standard which says this is how you need to be tested it just generic you say the fire alarm need to be maintained tested and maintained but doesn't elaborate how it has to be tested so the work in progress the standards of code BAS is talking about uh, you know in, in, in coming up codes maybe in 2025 you'll find there is a guide to test the smoke detector. As Dominic, well. uh, I would just like to add here that our IS code 2189 does state that, you know, uh, functional testing, they men mentioned there in the IS 2189 that, you know, a test should be performed wherein the smoke or heat enters the detector chamber and activates it and communicates to the panel. So that yeah. is in a way, okay, it's not, a, you know, it's not mandated as yet, but the code does say that this is what is testing is functional okay. testing means the smoke and heat should enter the detector chamber and communicate to the path. So but been misinterpreted in India by testing the detector by using the smoke can or I would say jute smoke or in an um, uh, where the cigarette butts they use many ways but it is not interpreted in different way yeah, yeah. Paul can you comment on that question yeah the only thing I was going to add here is that um, um, uh, standards the, the service standards we spoke about and I'm sure it's exactly the same in India as it is in many many countries um, they are codes of practice they're not the law the law then makes reference to the code of practice now from what I understand in India the law isn't actually enforced to actually to follow up the codes of practice but the codes of practice are the best practice actually out there and really if you, if you want to take that moral responsibility for the people that you're responsible for you need to be following those codes of practice that are actually in existence 
Move on to the next question. Arya Sharma looks like the facility manager. How frequently should detector be tested? Can I um, dive in there with that one? I mean, again, yeah, uh, what, yeah, what I would um, say there is, and again, this is this is common in many situations. It is dependent on the risks and the actual hazards. Most standards will have a minimum requirement, and in most instances, it will be a minimum of once a year. But for example, if it's a very dirty, dusty environment or a high risk environment, there may be a requirement to test two or sometimes four times a year. Um, you know, I've done, uh, for example, I've done a lot of work with military establishments. So you won't be surprised to hear that they test four times a year. So it really does depend on the risk of the hazard and also, um, you know, what potentially could be the dirt and the uh, and the contaminants and, and the risk assessment. You know, that can actually indicate how frequently um, the maintenance is actually carried out. And this is an area where we've seen here in England, uh, in the UK, um, a change because uh, historically the risk assessment was literally just to the risk of the, uh, what the risks and hazards are to the building and the occupants. But we're now actually seeing what are the risks and hazards to the ongoing performance of the fire detection system. So the, that risk assessment should be able to identify how frequently the defect detectors need to be inspected um, and also tested. So moving on to the third question, Ashish Tiwari is asking how above false ceiling detectors are the major challenge in industry for testing, maintenance on a replacement, mainly project like hotel where there are a lot of false ceilings. So what's your suggestion, Paul? Uh, if you have voids and voids can be created by uh, a full ceiling as soon as you have voids and i think it's 0.8 of a meter you do need to have some form of fire detection uh, in there and yes this then starts to present access issues how do you actually get into that void how do you actually to test and this has been a problem for many years in many regions and, and countries around the world um you know and, and again if you um, look at for example uh, king's cross fire in london um, the, the fire broke out underneath an escalator and it was because it wasn't actually uh, the detector wasn't actually maintained. Um, we now do have solutions for this and we've had solutions uh, for a number of years. We've got our Scorpion tester, which can be installed at the time the detector is actually installed and it can be wired outside of that uh, uh, that void so it means you can carry out safe testing without having to have the issue of accessing accessing the area. And what we find with our Scorpion tester is that as people start to become more risk averse, they start to see and understand the importance to make sure that the detectors are tested. And that is one of the solutions. So you have a, a method to test the false ceiling or a detector which are not accessible but easily. So I think Parul can uh, give more idea when after the webinar, probably you can get in, get in touch with Ashish. Ashish has a second question. In case of resident, you know, uh, Paul, uh, in India, above 14 meters, above 15 meters, uh, uh, having a fire alarm uh, system is necessity. So even if it's a residential apartment, you need to have a smoke detector. You have mm -hmm. common areas, you have, a, um, you know, apartments, so must have a smoke detector. So Ashish is asking, in case of resident, how possible a normal person aware how to check the codes and compliance? It's a very valid uh, question. Not many residents are aware that what are the store codes and standard, uh, whether the apartment society is maintaining or this thing. So he's asking, is there any code or compliance a normal person can understand? That's that's quite a tricky one. That one. Um, I mean, again, here here in the UK, um, I, I mentioned right at the beginning that we have two sections of five eight three nine. We have part one for commercial systems and part six for residential. Mm -hmm and um, you will have different devices residential devices they're made to different product standards they tend to be standalone devices um, and it's quite interesting to have a look at how that market has actually developed in recent years i mean with the uh, internet of things you know gaining in popularity residential alarms now have gone from devices that were five ten pounds to like 150 pound now so they've really gone up in value um, it is an interesting one that how do you, if you're a resident, how do you know? I mean, the the most of the residential alarms recommend just actually doing a button test. But as we've already said, that you would, you know, if you 
if it's your property, you know, you, you know, you, you perhaps you should be looking, thinking about, you know, should you be getting somebody who's competent to come in and actually test it? But this is a this is a, a grey area which is starting to open up because what we what we're seeing around the world is, uh, and again, different regions moving at different uh, markets, but there is a reduction in people owning their own properties, and you're getting more landlords and tenants. And when you've got landlords and tenants, that landlord, you know, in some areas has a duty, it has a law, you know, as a duty of care underneath the law to be responsible for the person living in there. So this is an area which is uh, uh, constantly uh, on the on the change at the moment. Um, it's a difficult one to answer that one. How do you know? Um, you, you know, you there, there should, you know, again, in the UK, there would be fire records for a building where you've got flats, and you should be able to, you know, to find that out. But if you think about going back to the Grenfell inquiry, you know, that was a devastating uh, issue there. And, you know, the tenants had actually pointed out um, to the building owner on several occasions that the, the system wasn't being maintained correctly. There was a number of particular problems uh, uh, with that. And unfortunately, the building owners, uh, you know, didn't <coughs> take notice of the complaints from the tenants. So, um, a question to Parul Verma uh, by Arya Sharma. Arya is asking, what are the benefits of using detector test, Parul? Yeah, uh, Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, Paul, you can carry on. I think let Paul speak. No, you go, you go, go on, you, yeah, go on. I'll let you. I'm, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, see the benefits of using uh, detector testers. The you know to conduct a functional testing, like I stated earlier, too. We have a fire alarm system in place, but then uh, we are not doing the testing to check that are they functional are they functional or not the smoke detectors so in case of a fire the detectors have to be functional and for that you know it is very important to use a testing equipment like say if you're using a testifier where we can test a multi sensor detector so we test the smoke and the heat detector wherein uh, the smoke enters the detector chamber and it informs the fire alarm panel that there's a smoke and so that means there can be a fire so that is that's the you know importance of using a detector tester because when there is a fire and if you are not aware you know whether your detector is working or not then it is futile to have a fire alarm system in place and sometimes the detector is blinking like i mentioned earlier too but that doesn't ensure that it is functional. It is operative when the smoke or heat enters the detector chamber. So it is very important that we use testing equipment for the detectors. I can add one more little story here, which I'm sure the audience will actually like. And I've seen uh, um, experience of this on, on, on several occasions. I mentioned during uh, the slides that uh, it's not only about testing the function of the, the device, but also checking that it's actually been installed correctly. And I have seen uh, my own eyes several times where a detector or an alarm has been installed onto uh, a ceiling and there's a void be uh, uh, behind it. And there is actually negative air pressure and the negative air pressure would actually draw the smoke around between the detector and the base or between the base and the ceiling. And it basically means the smoke never goes anywhere near the sensor to cause an alarm. Um, and, you know, it's because there's negative air pressure. There's a, a detector on the ceiling and there's basically um, a, a void beneath where there's a air pressure because there's a like a, a ventilation air brick or something there, which basically means that detector, if there was a fire, wasn't going to work. And I've seen it several times where the electronic test says, yes, I'm working fine, which it, the detector was, but the installation was actually at fault and the functional test actually discovered that. Uh, and now I've seen that both with residential alarms and also with commercial detectors. Yep, yeah, uh, it's a design uh, issue in many of the building, the way the detector has been positioned or placed. I don't know how many out of maybe 100, 60% uh, of the detector never detects smoke. As you said, the negative pressure is around and uh, we don't even look at it because aesthetically the uh, interior designer says this is they decide where to position the detector. They don't allow the fire contractor to, you know, do this method of positioning the detector. So it's all the interior guys comes in, you know, it has to be aligned with the tube light, or it has to be aligned with the LED lights, and, you know, aesthetically it has to be designed. So that's how 
the detector has been positioned. So moving on to Rajesh Nigam, he is asking, it is a very good question because you spoke about uh, logbook, you know, you have a manual logbook and you have an electronic uh, logbook. In India, uh, Paul, just to enlighten you, we, we do not have a system of uh, individual uh, fire protection or fire system logbook. They generally have a contractor comes in may, with a manual uh, annual maintenance contractor team comes, they check, they just put a tick, it is maintained on this, this day. But there is no proper log the way you showed that yes, these detector on a corridor number so and so or the floor number so and so has been tested, how often you tested. So his question is, what are what is the desirable frequency of testing? And our logbook viewed online by the property owner having fire detector installed. Uh, don't follow that question, just to read it for it. Okay. So, Rajesh, on the top, the question, the top question is asking. Yes, so, yeah, here we go. Yeah. And our logbook viewed online. Is it possible to view online by the property owner? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, there's two two questions here. So what's the desired frequency of testing? As I said, that that should be indicated by what the risks and the actual hazards actually are. As I said, you know, standards will tell you what the minimum requirement is, but you may have a requirement to test more frequently to make sure that the system is working correctly. And this could well be because of uh, the process that you have going on there. You know, you have a lot of airborne and dirt and contaminants, or it may be to do with the risk. And the, the example I gave uh, a little while ago was to do with like military establishments. They've got high risk there. So they test more frequently. They inspect more frequently. And again, you'll have all sorts of different buildings. <laughs> you know, it might be a, like a, um, you know, use... Um, uh, you know, a petrol plant or something, a petrol station or something like that. You know, anything where there's increased amount of risk, there is an increased need to make sure you're checking it on a more regular basis. And the next question is, are logbooks viewed online by property owners having fire detectors installed? Uh, there are systems now coming to the market uh, and it's quite interesting to see. And this has really all come about since that Hackett report that I spoke of on, out of the uh, Grenfell inquiry. And there are a number of solutions coming to the market. Um, some of them are actually built into fire panels. So the fire panels now come into the market that have that built in. Some of them are aftermarket solutions where they're basically they plug into the commercial fire detector and they collect the events that occur as they come out of the, uh, the principal and it sends and beams them up to the cloud. So you can then see exactly what's going on. So you can see when the engineer was on site, you can see what detectors have actually been tested. You then got other solutions like our XTR2 that's coming along, which basically the tester collects the data on what detectors have actually been uh, tested. And the report can be emailed to the uh, the building owner to say exactly what uh, you know detectors the engineer has actually uh, been tested. And as I say, you're going to see a number of different solutions coming to the forefront here. But it's really it's all about you know, uh, proving what devices uh, have actually been tested. Is a tick in a box good enough? That's the question. That's what you've actually got to ask yourself. You know, does the tick in the box actually prove anything? And in many instances, a tick in a box doesn't prove anything. But if you've got data that is collected, you know, from the fire detection, you've got a feedback loop. There you have, you've got that, uh, you know, that proof that that system is actually compliant. And it helps the building owner have that transparency. They can see exactly what's going on. They can look at their devices on the best systems and they can actually say, you know, I've got, uh, I can see I'm 60% of my devices have been tested. I've still got a few more months before all the rest of the devices are tested and they can see exactly what's actually going on. That's on the more expensive systems, the best systems that have some of this actual functionality. But there are a number of solutions out there. Oh, we have a lot of uh, Dominic, here sure, I would just like to add is that, you know, uh, when we spoke about the aerosol systems and then we move on to the electric electronic systems and in that now we have the latest XTR2 testifier which is XTR2 which has these uh, you know uh, wherein you can where, where the data is collected and you can mail it online it is a that kind of a system which so I do have a test uh, you know demo unit with me so in case anybody are interested in looking at that but like Paul said, that is the most expensive of all the systems, testing systems. So I can send all the details to the, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, uh, Nigam on that. 
so he can contact me for that okay thank you uh, parol we have a lot of question we are running out we are now one hour 36 minutes so we are in total supposed to one so let's let's catch up with few questions quickly and answer and uh, there is a question from the healthcare industry uh, just want to know what kind of detector more effective in healthcare well, again, it's going to be dictated by the risk assessment. Um, you know, if you help in healthcare, uh, hospitals, generally speaking, have a higher perception of risk. So they would want to make sure that they have, uh, you know, a compliance system, which is going to detect a fire detection system. Um, usually it's going to be as a minimum it's going to be an addressable fire detection system because you know when there is a fire on the building sometimes patients cannot be moved because of uh, their capacity they're you know not able to actually to move around so an addressable system will be the basic but when it comes down to the sensitivity um, you know it is going to depend on the risk it's quite typical to see many hospitals now fitting multi-sensors in there because that is one of the solutions that's going to give you the, the, that best balance between and giving you the correct level of sensitivity but at the same time not you know not risking false alarms because many uh, hospitals have had quite high levels of false alarms and part of the reason for that is that they want to make sure um, that the system is going to be sensitive enough to detect a fire um, so they, they have seen, you know, that's been one area where one, the, the, the person there, the client who's actually responsible is asking questions about the maintenance engineer. Are they actually qualified? Are they skilled to work on it? Even down to looking at the equipment. I mean, I've seen hospitals now saying, you know, hang on a minute. There's, you know, these engineers are coming on. They're using solo aerosols and yet we've got multi sensors everywhere. Shouldn't they be using testifier? Um, so they're usually very informed and they're usually using, you know, some of the better fire detection systems. And I would say uh, it's a bit of a generalization, but it's all going to be it would come out of a risk assessment. But it would be an addressable system that has multi sensors is typically what they would have. OK, let's move on quickly. Another again, will it be possible to calibrate or adjust the sensitivity while using the toolkit, or the test detector toolkit? Can you adjust the system? True test, true test. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's possible, isn't it? Yeah, no, you, you, the, the true test is a sensitivity test. It doesn't change the sensitivity of the detector. It measures the level of obs obscuration, the level of smoke that goes into the chamber to cause an activation. Uh, because a functional test, if you, I mean, as I say, even though that is the most common form around the world, um, it is um it's a very pragmatic approach to getting you the highest level of confidence with the minimum amount of actual effort in doing the testing when you do a sensitivity test you're using a more detailed test sequence which means it's going to be more cost associated with it it is a requirement when it comes to testing the ul devices according to nfpa 72 and it's really measuring you know every few years measuring um what is the build and uh, of dust and dirt that's within a detector and it's quite an interesting area here, and it's 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 really uh, become um, a, a key point uh, because of our reliance on the optical chamber. I think the best thing to do on that one is to um, uh, we can dive into that in more detail on the, on the, on the any on the follow up session where we'll talk more about that in detail. Okay, the Mukesh Sharara is asking for XDR two uh, parole, so you can probably you can talk to him. Yeah. Later when I share this. Yeah, Mr. Arora can mail me, uh, send me a mail. Oh, I can send him all the details. Perfect. And I just want to add one thing here, Dominic. We are participating in Municipalica in Bangalore from the 20th, 28th to the 30th of uh, November. So we'll be at the palace grounds uh, and uh, Dominic will send you all the details, all the participants, all the details of this event. We are going to be there, wherein we'll be showcasing all these products. Okay, moving on to Sanjeev is suggesting that BS, BS9999 mandate the testing kit instead of uh, testing kit instead of aerosol types. Is BS999 mandate? So, question to Paul. So, I'm, I'm trying to understand that question a bit. I mean, basically, uh, all, uh, yeah, pretty much all worldwide standards apart from um, Australia and um, America and Canada 
Uh, they just require a functional test. Now, no standards go as far as actually saying how you carry out that functional test. So your functional test could be with an aerosol canister or it could be a, with an electronic tester. Us as a, a responsible manufacturer want to point out that there is differences between these products and it's really important for the competent persons if they're using aerosols to be properly trained because if they're not trained at all there are certain situations where you know they could actually cause problems but no standards mandate you know uh, against aerosols at all aerosols are still the main solution that's used around the world but there are better solutions out there so Arunagiri uh, is asking how heat sensing element of a multi sensor is tested by using electronic cartridges in test fire. That's a that's an easy one. That one, yeah. Uh, our uh, testifier products have used capsules or cartridges to produce the smoke or carbon monoxide, but when it comes to heat, they've got a heat generator built into them uh, as well. So. They just basically have a heater element and a fan that kicks in to blow the heat. <laughs> it doesn't use any electronic cartridge for generating heat. Wonderful. Very good question and very fantastic answer for that. So, uh, Sanjeevani Krishnaswamy, what is the best detector for an elevator archway? Oh, that's a good one. Um, that's that's a very topical subject at the moment. And um, there's generally two types of devices. But you don't forget elevators or uh, lifts can be of various different heights and there's various different technical requirements. Um, you've got two, the two types of systems, which we'll go into in more detail in later uh, 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 sessions, is the difference between an aspirated system and a point detector. Now, the key bit here, really, I'm not going to mention because I can't I can't guess what height an elevator is. It could be, you know, you know, tens of floors or it could be just a couple of floors. But certainly uh, the aspirated system is better when it's actually the longer shafts and a point detector can also be used on the shorter shafts. But the key bit to do with elevator shafts is that once the fire detection is put in there, because don't forget any type of shaft at all is a chimney. And if a fire would break out, it would travel through the building, through the elevator shaft. So it's absolutely imperative that the shaft has some form of detection. You need to choose which one you go on. But the other factor you need to bring into that is that how are you going to maintain it? And it, unfortunately, we've all seen the James Bond films where we see James Bond climbing on top of the carriage. But there have been numerous uh, occasions where maintenance engineers have actually killed themselves by falling off and down there. So there is a duty of care to the building owner to make sure that whatever solution is put in can be safely maintained. And this, again, is where we have a, a solution. We have our Scorpion product that I mentioned earlier, and we do two versions of it. We do Scorpion ASD that can be used for ASD systems and Scorpion Point that can be used point. And the whole point of Scorpion here in a lift shaft is once it's installed, you don't have to go back into the lift shaft because there's there can be huge costs associated with it, but there is huge risks as well associated with it. So the last question for the day, uh, Paul, this is a Nina James. Is asking since the technology is so advanced, why don't right. they clean themselves? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, we're always looking to improve and uh, cleaning is a is an interesting area here because I mean, one of the sections I'm going to be talking about, I'm not going to be talking about cleaning themselves, but detectors, cleaning detectors. Again, you'll find that the de uh, detector manufacturers, you know, have their own recommendations that detectors need to be cleaned. Detectors have a life statement on them. Uh, you know, many detectors have, for example, a life statement of 10 years. But that 10 years is if that detector is installed in a clean environment. If it's put into a dirty environment, you might find it actually fails within months. In six months, it could actually fail actually working. But coming back to cleaning ourselves, we we know we 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 haven't yet got that technology for cleaning ourselves. But uh, we are. I I would like to interrupt. I think we do have uh, now. We have introduced dust air uh, as a part of our you know range of products. So that uh, like while you're maintaining your detectors, you can also when like you know JLL and CBRE and everybody who maintain these buildings every month. You know they do the cleaning of detectors every month. More than, you know, even testing, cleaning is mandatory. You know, I met with Brigade Group in Bangalore. I met with the JLL people here. And they all wanted that something which would clean the detectors, even if, you know, they don't test it. So now we have the dust air, which can, you know, at least 
clear whatever dust is inside as long as it's not totally contaminated so i can talk about that also people can contact me for this and is i can let you all know this this is also an interesting area as well which relates to the new products and um we've had many reports back from the field where engineers that have moved from aerosols to electronic testers they're reporting that the detectors are lasting much much longer than they are from aerosols uh so yes. again this is an area of development that is actually coming out and i wouldn't be surprised to see in future re versions of our products that we ha have uh, cleaning functions built into it because they've got fans that blow air through and those fans will disperse any build up and dirt and dust but don't forget when it comes to cleaning anything you know if it's done regularly you, the dirt and dust won't build up if you try using an aerosol duster for example on a detector that's been in a in like a soup factory where it's powdered soup or something you know it might it hasn't been cleaned for many years it won't dislodge it and the only way of cleaning it is to remove that detector send it back to the manufacturer they do most of them offer the deep cleansing and recalibration and send them out but the problem is that is usually cost prohibitive that's a lot of costs associated with that but that's a good subject for future discussion i think that one i think uh, probably the person who put up this question must be understanding you know you have air conditioning the split unit has its own cleaning method uh, of dust and the camera cctv cameras cleaning itself the lenses so probably yeah. they would have gone and said why not uh, detect it also having a cleaning method probably yeah so good questions and uh, we are end up the question answer here uh, paul and uh, we are over short by 47 minutes but it is quite interesting and i'm sure paul will appreciate the audience uh, indian audience uh, which is your first experience interacting with indian audience uh, paul uh, you know what do you think about this session how was the interaction it's been particularly exciting i've loved all the questions and uh it's been really interesting i mean i i, I have had dealings with uh, uh fire alarm engineers from india before they often come on our normal training courses but to have the ability to talk to building owners and consultants uh it, it for me is really exciting it's the market that um you know i want i want to be more and more involved with because once you make them aware they will start asking questions of their maintenance engineers and that is absolutely key you know i'm, I'm really I'm, I'm really pleased that this session has come about and i'm looking forward to the, the subsequent sessions so that's uh, indian indian ask many questions before they buy they want to be convinced and uh, they are very clear because if you see we have many engineers in india yeah, out of every 10 guys, there are three guys are engineers in India. So the questions that keep asking, why, 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 why not this, why not this, why not? This is how the Indian thinks about it. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful to have you, Paul, and uh, early morning for you, uh, you know, coming, joining us and enlightening our, you know, Indian customers. And I'm sure India over the period, we'll see every building fire alarm system do function and everybody has a kit to test the detector that's the objective that's why parul is here and parul is here to help us assist every guy who's there in today's session knows about the testing method and uh, we'll be sharing all the questions that has come on board here we'll share you the people who are attended and you can at your leisure probably you can answer one to one and everybody is saying thanks so it was wonderful a lot of comments coming for congratulating paul for you know wonderfully enlightening them it was nice to have you we look forward to see you again in the month of february the series two and i'm sure everybody will get a cpd endorse certificate by fia thank you parul you are also very patiently listening to this whole session and question answer I'm sure you have many more work because you need individual questions, you know, there are questions coming up. I'm sure you touch base with them. We have 380 participants and we love to answer everyone. So we we'll look forward to see you, uh, Paul, again. Till then, have a wonderful days and stay fit, stay healthy. Look forward to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, Paul. Thank you, Dominic.